Hello, everybody. My name is Joe Carr. I graduated from PC in 1983, and I work in the college's marketing communications office, and I'm very happy to have all of you here with us today. Chances are that you, like me, are interested in today's discussion in large part because you have fond memories of sitting in a classroom where Richard Grace was standing in front of you. Um, we, many of us have had that experience, and, and wonderful it was. Since arriving as a student in 1958, Dr. Grace has become a PC institution and an icon. He's been here practically interrupted since coming in as a student at that time, went away to Fordham to get a doctorate, but joined the faculty at a young age and remains as an emeritus professor to this day in the Department of History. He's studied the parts of the college history that he did not personally experience, so no one is better qualified and no one is more enthusiastic about this subject. We're very fortunate to have him with us today to take us on this trip through a discussion of the history of the college we all love for the next hour or so. So Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your I'm, time. And, I'm happy for the invitation. And all you have done to, uh, to prepare. And we should acknowledge up front the person who laid the groundwork for establishing the record of the history that we all rely on so much. And that is uh, your friend, the late Donna McCaffrey. Yes, yes. Um, Donna and I talked about the most recent installment of the college history just a short time before she died. And um, so we were, we were, I wasn't trying to copy the way in which she wrote or the style with which she wrote. I, I uh, um, adopted, as, as you know, from the book, uh, um, a different approach to it. But we had a good conversation and we were pretty much lined up uh, not long before she passed away. And the book that uh, Professor Grace referenced there is the one you can see behind me. It's Values That Endure, the college's volume published at, on the occasion of the centennial in 2017. And Richard wrote 35 pages of that book, a thematic history of the essentially the second half of the college's life. And it's spectacular. If you haven't, haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. Uh, copies of the book are still available at the Barnes and Noble store on campus and online through uh, through their website. So a great book, 179 pages, but those 35 pages are the best ones. Um, <laughs> Richard, the, uh, the year 1918 has been discussed a great deal lately in the context of the horrible, horrible flu pandemic that the world had to deal with at that time. But that was also the year between PC's charter and its opening. What do we know about the effect of that pandemic on the birth of the college? Well, uh, the college uh, was chartered in February of 1917, and two months later, the country went to war against Germany. And uh, many of the local fellows who were drafted were from uh, lower income levels, immigrant families to a great extent, uh, who would have seen Providence College as their opportunity uh, for a higher education. And they were going off to war and World War I, which looked like it was going to take uh, a few months to, to be polished off, was going on year after year after year. And so there was no telling when uh, this uh, group of young men was going to be able to come to college. The, um, uh, uh, construction of Harkins Hall was uh, partly because of money the Dominicans had and the bishop gave them some money as well, but they needed a whole lot more money and that had to be raised through 1917, 1918. Ultimately, it cost about a little more than $6 million in today's currency. Uh, and it was dedicated in the uh, spring of 1919, in May of 1919. And uh, by that point in time, a lot of the young men had been demobilized uh, and were, you know, back eligible for attendance. Now, the question about the flu and uh, the vulner vulnerability of the college uh, to uh, effects of the flu was strongest in the fall of 1918. Um, the flu actually had a considerable bearing on what was happening on the front lines in Europe because a lot of Americans died from the flu. And the German army, which was making its last big effort, was really decimated by the flu in midsummer of 1918. So the war is over by November of 1918. The troops are coming home. Harkins is under construction. The question is, how devastating is the flu going to be? And 
as far as the young men were concerned, it wasn't uh, so terrible as they might have anticipated. And the big question was whether it was going to affect the building's trades uh, so that Harkins couldn't be completed in time. As it turned out, that didn't happen. Nearly a thousand people died in Providence from the Spanish flu uh, in the fall uh, and winter of 1918-19, but the uh, health issue was largely uh, uh, resolved by the spring of 1919 and the college got to open in uh, September of 1919. This is a question of um, vulnerability of the college at certain points in time for health reasons or financial reasons or internal disputes or whatever. We can go into that as you, as you like, but there's, there's the story of 1918-19. It's a theme for people who study history, isn't it? How peoples overcome very difficult times and emerge in, in some cases right. stronger. What does history tell us about people who, who are able to manage through times of terrible strife like this, like that was, I should say? Uh, you know, we're in, we're in the middle of a situation now which is going to give us a really good lesson. And the uncertainties of the moment require uh, decisions to be made or decisions to be delayed. Uh, and you have to live with the consequences of those decisions. If we can move back to uh, a prior instance, um, which is about halfway between the Spanish flu and uh, COVID-19, there was an um, episode uh, epidemic of flu in 1957, in the fall of 1957. And in fact, I lost a, a, a week of school at that point in time. I was a senior in high school then. Providence College had just acquired the, the big residence properties from the House of the Good Shepherd, uh, Joseph Hall and Stephen Hall. And Stephen Hall downstairs, um, where there are now classrooms and the uh, uh, copy center, uh, that was a giant lounge. And I uh, learned from Father Gardner back at that time that the flu was so extensive on campus in the fall of uh, 1957 that they turned that big lounge into a giant infirmary. Now, I guess there wasn't much social distancing possible if they put something like 50 cots in that lounge and downstairs of, of Stephen Hall. Uh, I tried to find uh, something about it in back issues of the cow, but all I could find was that Joe Mullaney couldn't get his basketball team to practice because so many of them were sick. Um, but that wasn't, uh, that flu in 57 wasn't uh, as severe as what we're experiencing now. I'd like to mention to folks who are joining us today, we're happy to have now about 185 people with us, which makes us by far the largest of these uh, sessions that we have had with our alumni in the past, over the past few months. So thank you all very much. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to pose a question to Dr. Grace, please put it there. And I think you'll like the first one. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I'll lob it at you. Richard, two minutes in, I have a question already, and this comes from Kim up in Manchester, New Hampshire. How has Dr. Grace not aged one week in 25 years? I'm sorry, say again. <laughs> Kim would like to know how it is that you have not aged one week in 25 years. That's a very kind person. Either that <laughs> or you bribed him to say that. <laughs> uh, so, may, may, well, teaching keeps you alive. Um, it, it keeps the mind alive, keeps you active. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful way of life. Absolutely. That's, that's well said and makes a lot of sense. We're going to talk about some themes as we go through the next uh, hour or so, but one thing we'd like to talk about briefly, kind of at the top here, perhaps a little surprising, is the college's alma mater. Uh, Richard has some, some thoughts on its significance, will tell us a little more about its origin and uh, some other things like that, but first we'd like to play a little clip for you. This comes from a session just a couple of weeks ago. Several of the Dominican friars gathered in St. Dominic Chapel right here on campus to create a recording of the alma mater for the class of 2020. Beautiful job, and uh, it's uh, worth, worth a listen. Let's take a moment to check out a piece of this. I don't think 
tell us a little bit about it, Richard, and how, how you, the origin, how you feel when you hear that song, what it means to you. We, we have uh, people on the uh, meeting list who uh, stretch back to the 1950s and all the way up to uh, the current. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what the experience uh, of people has been with hearing the alma mater, but I was in a conversation with a group of students from the class of 1980 about 10 days ago, and some of them commented that they were quite unfamiliar with the alma mater because we tried to sing it at the end of the meeting. It was a little bit of a messy effort. The, the meter wasn't exact, and, and uh, the, the words weren't always there, and people didn't know the tune. And, and it prompted me to think that, um, you know, maybe we could uh, uh, do a better job of acquainting students while they're undergraduates with the alma mater and, uh, and then uh, uh, in, in later days, years, years beyond graduation, they might be able to join in singing the, uh, the alma mater. I was uh, talking with Brian Barber yesterday about um, Notre Dame's use of the alma mater. Those of you who watch Notre Dame's football games will know that uh, at the end of every home game, the band and the football team and a lot of the fans will gather at one end of the field and sing the alma mater. And that is, sounds like such a good idea, but um, I, I can tell you a little bit about the history, but there are still some gaps in, in my knowledge of that um, according to Paul O'Malley, the person responsible for the text of the alma mater is a priest uh, who came from County Cork in Ireland. His name was John Archdeacon, a Dominican priest, and he was a member of the uh, education department at PC. Uh, looking online to, to see what I could find out, it seems as though the copyright was 1938. So um, it, it may have been that it was adopted earlier than that, but was put into print by 1938. The music comes from Jan Sibelius's tone poem, Finlandia. And uh, it is a very gentle piece of music that comes in the middle of a gigantic uh, uh, piece honoring uh, Sibelius's homeland of, of Finland. And so, um, I think it was a nice piece to adopt. Other schools have uh, adopted uh, various tunes for their alma maters, but this is, is a really lovely one. I can remember, um, if, if you don't mind giving you, a couple, giving you a couple of examples beyond the beautiful rendition that the Dominicans did 10 days ago, um, a couple of other examples of the alma mater. In, uh, some of you who are watching were present for the centennial celebration on February 14th, uh, uh, 2017 at the State House. And um, with uh, speeches by Governor Raimondo and Father Shanley and myself and some of the PC alums who were in the Rhode Island legislature, um, the crowd was really worked up and toward the end of that session, the uh, premier chorus at the college, I Cantori, sang the alma mater. And they did such a wonderful job of presenting it so gently. It was reverence. And uh, that's one of the best occasions that I can think of. There's a, another example, and, and here I want to bring Donna McCaffrey back into the picture, although by this time she has died. Um, her funeral was uh, on the west side of the Hudson at Blauvelt, but her burial was in Queens at Woodside, uh, the cemetery in Woodside in Queens on Long Island. And so, um, we had to, you know, rush over the Triborough Bridge and get to the cemetery and get the casket set up over the grave. And we, then we waited and we waited and we waited because uh, there was a nun coming to see the prayers at the gravesite, and uh, she wasn't getting there, probably because she was driving sensibly and the van driver who had us was, was driving, um, I would say kind of wildly. Uh, so we got there very early. Donna's sister came over to Paul O'Malley and Tom Grazabia and me and asked us if we could sing the alma mater. And we had to look at one another and say, do we, do we all know all the words? And we figured that 
if, if one of us failed, the other two would pick him up and so on. So we sang the alma mater at Donna's grave. And uh, it was a beautiful moment in that graveside uh, ceremony. I think Donna would have been happy. It is beautiful, that's for sure. And I think we all feel uh, those emotions every time that we hear it. And that's testament to its enduring value and just the, the beauty of the whole thing. And by the way, I give a lot of credit, Richard, to anybody who can work the words, not air beguile into a phrase or sentence, right? Rainy <laughs> Fortin's favorite line from the <laughs> alma mater. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. So uh, and, uh, I did put a link to the uh, YouTube recording of the, that performance in the chat in case anybody would like to uh, take a look at it. I apologize for uh, the uh, technical uh, difficulty there with um, uh, playing it live with this, with this group. But nevertheless, there it is. We'd like to take a look at it. Um, Richard, let's talk a little bit about what you've called the, the changing face of PC. It began with, as you described so beautifully, just one building. And now look at it, 105 acres of just beauty and function and, and everything one would want in a contemporary college campus. An amazing transition in 101 years. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking just the other day about the naming of places. That's, that's a, a big issue when colleges uh, construct new buildings nowadays. And uh, um, I was thinking when the college opened, uh, they wanted to name the original building after the bishop who had sponsored the uh, Matthew Harkins, who had sponsored the establishment of PC. Um, and there was nothing else to name uh, except for one thing. Can you guess what it was? That's a question to everybody. Can you guess what the other thing to name was? It was the baseball field. Oh. They, uh, the, there was only one building on campus that was Harkins Hall. But the previous bishop of Providence was named Hendrickin, and so the baseball field came to be named uh, Hendrickin Field, and it served as baseball field for the whole 20th century. So um, the rest of the, of the land is a wilderness at that point in time. The Bradley Mansion, uh, which we call Martin Hall, was there at the time. That uh, was the home of the Attorney General of Rhode Island during the Jacksonian period in the 19th century. But otherwise, this is a pretty naked landscape. And it, it uh, builds with acceleration in the early uh, part of the 21st century. So it seemed as though we were adding a building almost every year. Um, and as a, a wise guy, I was going to uh, refer to uh, Father Shanley as Brian the Builder in the um, history that I was writing. I was asked not to use that term, so I scratched it. But uh, I, I think that uh, my old friend, uh, Father Shanley, deserves so much credit for the changing face of the landscape. There are now, I, if my tally is right, 46 buildings on campus, on a 105 acre campus. And when the new plan for uh, the college was presented to the city back in the 1990s, the agreement was that the college was not going to be spreading in a kind of cancerous way into neighborhoods taking over properties. And so this is, at least for the foreseeable future, the footprint of Providence College. Uh, and you know, various developments have, have taken place to uh, uh, use the available property without wrecking the landscape, which is very beautiful. Uh, the, the first week of May is always the prettiest time on campus, and it was hard, only a handful of people there to see it this year, but those people who come for graduation have usually missed the very peak which comes at the start of May, and the landscape for the campus is, I, I think, pretty handsome. It's been, been uh, it's been a nice place to spend my life. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, we have a question from, from one of our friends with us today. Richard, what, do, what can you tell us about the Chapin property? What kind of a hospital was that? That's now what became the, the longer campus building, as we used to call right. it, Dora Fennel, Howley, and so on? Um, Charles V. Chapin Hospital was named after a 19th century doctor who was the director of health in the city of Providence. And the hospital served many purposes. Uh, it functioned for uh, general medical purposes. It had a tuberculosis uh, ward. It had uh, a ward for uh, 
psychiatric uh, purposes, uh, and so um, it, it fulfilled lot, lots of functions. The students who have taken a walk in past years when Donna McCaffrey would give a tour of the campus and take people through the tunnels and, and so forth will know that there was a morgue down there. And, and the morgue at Chapin Hospital eventually became the ceramic studio at Providence <laughs> College. Um, but the, the various buildings in Georgian style um, left us a nice architectural legacy uh, when the college acquired that property. Now, like any institution, I'd like to go back to a phrase you used a few minutes ago, Richard, that is moments of vulnerability. PC has had you know, its share, for sure. Yeah. What have some of those been, and what has been, what was the impact, and how did the college recover from the most difficult of its times? One that I would point to right away is what happened in World War II, because uh, as, as an all-male college, um, with the draft in progress and uh, the numbers of students who could enroll being so badly diminished that in 1943 only 66 students were in the incoming class that September. The college went to three semesters uh, uh, in the course of an academic season uh, because it was anticipated so much shuttling in and out of uh, students who were going off to war or perhaps c coming back uh, having uh, left the services by virtue of being wounded or whatnot and so the college changed this academic calendar for that year but the big question was survival financially and uh, what rescued the college was the army specialized training program in 1943-44 this um, I don't know how many there were altogether, but a lot of troops were brought in for various kinds of academic work. They were taking classes in, in the college uh, and living in Aquinas Hall. And um, that really saved the college from, you know, being right at the brink financially in 1943. Uh, the program was ended in 1944, um, as uh, I saw a picture years ago of, of all these uh, servicemen marching from PC down to the train station. The, the purpose of, of that happening in the spring of 1944 was that they were all being shipped to Europe for uh, the invasion of Normandy. Uh, the, in that year of 1944, Congress passed the GI Bill of Rights. And that meant that when so many of those uh, servicemen came back from Europe, they were able to enroll at Providence College with government tuition benefits. And uh, that really injected a, a whole new kind of life in the college with so many young men, particularly local young men, who were uh, uh, given, uh, I think it was, three years, I'm not sure, I think it was three years of tuition benefits uh, upon uh, enrolling. The college continues to have a program for, for veterans. It's as administered through the School of Continuing Education. PC is listed as a yellow ribbon school at the moment. And so even though the ROTC program isn't as large as it was back in the 1950s, there is a continuing ROTC program and uh, this uh, program for, for veterans benefits, which the college, college and the government contribute to. So that's a long-winded way of talking about what happened in, in World War II. Among the many World War II veterans who used the GI Bill to attend Providence College was somebody who ended up having tremendous impact and that was Joe Shanley, right? Oh, Father right. Shanley's yes. brother, class of yeah. 26. You know, when I was teaching, I still do teach courses in, in World War II, but going back 20 years, there were still people alive who uh, could come to class as primary sources. Uh, Larry Guzzi's wife uh, was one. She was strafed by an American fighter plane uh, when she and her father were on a road in, in South Germany. Joe Shanley was a radio man on a B-19 bomber. Um, uh, there was there was one time I'm I'm telling too many tales here, but before the the uh, line of primary source people died out, as it has almost completely died out now, uh, in back to back weeks I had um, a Holocaust survivor from Barrington, and 
an SS corporal from Fall River. Mm. So, um, but bringing those people to, to campus uh, was exciting for the students and for me as well. Let's take a little time to talk about some of the dramatic moments in the college's history. And we have actually a few questions, more than, more than a couple that relate to 50 years ago, right now. So the class of, when the class of 1970 was about to graduate, Kent State happened. You were a young faculty member, very involved in, in, the, in dealing with that and helping yeah, the students yeah. deal with it. Take a, tell us a little bit about those days. I wrote a, a few questions on my pad for quizzes that I like to give. Uh, uh, one of them is, is kind of playful thing, uh, but, but the other uh, two are much more serious. And one involves the uh, uh, major developments. Uh, so for all of you out there, think for a moment, what would you think uh, were the major turning points in the history of the college? And I know that from looking at the list of people attending, the comments suggest uh, some things that are very personal for individuals and some things that are big issues for the college. So this is a, is a big issue. Uh, what, what would you say were the major turning points? What was, after the founding of the college, the single most important turning point in the history of the college? We had a quick answer, Richard. I'll throw it at you. If that, and here it is again, the admission of women. And Absolutely. So you're going to have to give out high grades today. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, the admission of women changed uh, the college in so many ways. You know, it occurred in 1971 when young men from PC were still being inducted into the army so that they went virtually from graduation to the jungle. And so there was a kind of heavy atmosphere on campus in those years, partly because of the worry that, that the guys were going to get their degrees and then they were going to go off to, to get um, shot up in uh, Vietnam. And the admission of women had a huge academic effect on the college, but it also had a wonderful effect on the atmosphere, on the general atmosphere of the college because there was a kind of leavening of that gloom that existed. You know, at, at that point in time, I was directing the honors program and the last all male classes in the honors program were those fellows who were, um, uh, who knew that they had gotten um, a bad number in, in the draft lottery and that they were going to be uh, uh, sent overseas in all likelihood uh, into combat. Uh, with the arrival, and I, I, that showed up in the discussions in my honors classes, there was um, uh, a, a really uh, heavy kind of uh, tone about discussion much of the time, ultra, ultra serious, I mean, not surly, but, but ultra serious. When the women arrived, the seriousness didn't leave, but a kind of relief from that heaviness uh, that was affecting the uh, campus all-male population was, was achieved. And in addition to that, uh, the effect of women on the academic life of the college was just gigantic. Another couple of other uh, of our audience pointing out, of course, the Aquinas fire, 1977. Uh, obviously a very dramatic moment in the college's history and another one where you were very involved with the students and in, in helping them get through that. Well, uh, that was going to be one of my other questions, uh, uh, what the most dramatic moment would be in anybody's experience over the years. I suspect that some people would, would cite uh, a, a very personal uh, moment, but in terms of the life of the college, um, I asked this question of the um, honors alumni of 1980 when we were talking a few weeks ago, and uh, they responded instantly uh, as a chorus that uh, the fire was, was the most dramatic thing. And the second thing they mentioned was the blizzard, which came only three months after the fire. Um, but you know, the fire was a defining moment in the experience of the college for, for people who 
let's say graduated in the 60s or the 50s who are participating today or people who graduated in the 90s or, or beyond. It's a part of the college history. For people who were alive at that moment, like Father Shanley, who would have been a sophomore at that time, uh, it left a lasting mark on their lives. You know, that, it was at that point in time that the word family became so much more common in conversations about the people of PC. Um, Father Peterson re regularly used the, the word family and it became uh, common thereafter to talk about the people of PC as a family. The, um, I, I remember that morning um, of the fire going to my office, which was downstairs in Stephen Hall and various faculty members uh, drifted in. Uh, and ultimately, there were about uh, a dozen of us there, and um, you know, people keep kept asking, as did students and other people in who were PC supporters. Why did God let this happen? And nobody had an answer. Let's talk about some happier moments. Okay. How about some sports championships, for example, okay. and start with the NIT in the 60s and run through hockey in five years ago. I went to every NIT game I could go to in the 1960s. <laughs> and I was thinking this morning about, you know, how we react to sports. Um, I, don't, I don't think, uh, personally, I'm speaking personally now, that it's necessary for a team that I cheer for to, to win the ultimate championship game in order for that team to be considered uh, a, an exciting team to watch. You know, I can go to Fenway Park and, and I'm happy if the Red, Red Sox win the afternoon or evening game that I see there. And, and in a sense, it doesn't matter if they, if they get to the World Series because I've seen good baseball. Well, I was thinking just this morning about those NIT years. And I wonder if some of you will remember this play that I'm about to describe to you. It was... I believe a game against St. Louis in the 1960 NIT and uh, PC, uh, um, I was sitting behind one of the baskets and uh, um, PC got a rebound. The ball was handed over to Johnny Egan who used to tear at breakneck speed down the court. He started at breakneck speed down the court toward the other basket, spotted Lenny Wilkins about 50 feet ahead of him and lofted a pass behind his back and over his head halfway down the court and Wilkins got it and scored. And it's the best basketball play I've ever seen. <laughs> Uh, those, those were ec ec exciting years at the NIT, and what, I, I suppose one of the most famous pictures of PC Sports is a picture of Vinnie Ernst standing at the foul line in a Holy Cross game in 1961, and I, I was uh, sitting over to his left in the stands, and I could see the people up in the first balcony shaking the supports for the basket, and so Ernst missed the, uh, missed, missed the foul shot. Um, and the referees didn't intervene to give him another, but he, he was involved in every uh, scoring play from uh, through the overtime, and PC won the game. It's a great shot, which is prominently displayed on the wall in Harkins Hall, just outside the president's office. So yeah. yes. you know, walking on the second floor can can see that one for sure. Let's, and by the way, uh, I know you were you were very pleased and proud just five years ago when Nate Lehman's hockey team won the. NCAA championship too. That was a great moment for Friar Sports. Oh, it, it was. Um, you know, I, I remember um, the first time PC was in the uh, NCAA hockey uh, final. It was in 1985 and it was against uh, RPI. And I was living in England at the time. I was on sabbatical in Cambridge and I was at the, um, uh, there it is, <laughs> that's 2015. <laughs> Yeah, that's the that guys. Such an exciting moment. Um, let's let's uh, let's describe uh, what happened here for those of you who uh, weren't watching or never got a chance to understand what happened. PC was trailing by a score of three to two, with about um, oh, nine or ten minutes left in the game, and one of the PC players was 
I was trying to get to the bench for a line change. And so he, he lofted a soft shot to the BU net just to buy some time for the line change. Hmm. Well, the goalie caught it. The BU goalie caught it, but dropped it. And it fell between his feet and trickled across the goal line. So the score was tied. And uh, a couple of minutes after that, uh, uh, another PC player uh, lined the shot over that same goalie's shoulder and the score was four to three in PC's favor and the team was able to withstand a blistering attack uh, by uh, uh, BU with an extra skater in the last minutes and the result was the victory that you just saw in that picture. Brandon Tanev scored that game-winning goal now an excellent National Hockey League player so he's yeah. doing great things and, and right. let's not forget by the way the great success in women's sports and two NCAA championships in women's yeah. cross country under the great head coach, Ray Tracy. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the first two NCAA team championships that PC enjoyed was for women's cross country. And they were for runners from all over the world. And, um, uh, I should also mention that while we're talking about hockey, at the beginning of the 20th century, a women's hockey team was the dominant hockey team, uh, collegiate hockey team in the East. They won the, uh, the last ECAC uh, tournament they were in, and then for the next three years, they won the big, uh, they won the uh, Hockey East championships. And so women's hockey really had a tremendous stretch early in the 20th, uh, 21st century. I'd like to go back to your questions, uh, Richard, and just putting a couple together. I don't think we can ask, answer them exactly as they're posed because they are about policies relative to naming buildings. But can you tell us a little bit about some things you've observed about how the college has decided on the names of buildings? Who will be honored by having buildings named after them? Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's as a result of uh, donors making, uh, like the Ryans with the, with the business building, or the Ruanes with the uh, Ruane Academic Center and the Friar Development Center. In other instances, buildings have been named, well, the names have been inherited, let's say, uh, when the Good Shepherd property was acquired, and uh, names have been after Dominican saints like Raymond Hall, or Aquinas Hall, or um, Harkins Hall after the Bishop of Providence at the time that the college was established. So the names, uh, you know, come from all over the place. Donors, saints, mm -hmm. saints donors. <laughs> Former uh, presidents. We have Former presidents, yeah. I was, I, was on the, I was on the corporation at the time when the field house was being built. And uh, the... Uh, Father, Father Peterson was president at the time, and uh, uh, Bishop Jeleno, uh, as uh, chairing uh, the meeting uh, temporarily, asked Father Peterson if he could leave the room for the moment. And uh, he suggested to the corporation that they name the field house after Father Peterson. So when he came back into the room, he found out that he was going to have a, a building named after him. Um, so, um, yeah, named after um, former presidents. And the, one of the names that always tickles me is Fennel Hall, because Father Fennel was the bursar of the college for many years. Um, I think he smiled once a year. I, uh, I don't think I caught any of them. <laughs> so he was ultra, ultra, ultra serious uh, uh, money manager for, for the college. But um, Fennel, which is the most uh, east, easternmost building on the campus, is named after uh, a bursar of the college. So some of the characters, uh, the, the great people, who, the faculty, Dominicans, other people who have been in your universe since 1958, I'd like to have a quiz now. Okay. I'd like to I'd like to give people a quiz, and this is for Dominican nicknames. Uh, so I'll give you the nickname and give you a second, and then I'll pass on to another, and we'll finally uh, assign real names to them. How about the Duke? Okay. How about the Bush? <laughs> <laughs> How about the Turkey? And Mickey Mouse, how about 59? And the Monk, 
Oh, okay. I'll tell you who who, who they were. Uh, there are there are some other nicknames, but um, I think I, I think I know one, Richard. There's one I'm holding back. <laughs> okay. well, I have a guess who that might be too. But uh, was uh, was the Duke Father Schneider? It was Father Schneider. Yeah. God, the um, father of friar hockey. After whom? That's that's right. Yeah. He, you know, F Father Schneider, whom I had for for elementary German, looked like he was a gruff man. He was really a sweet man, <laughs> and, and hockey was, was much of, of, of his life. And uh, I, th I think he was a good friend to the young women who lived in the House of the Good Shepherd, uh, you know, kind of like a chaplain uh, for them. The Bush was, for those of you who are history majors, Father Hinne Bush, uh, who was known as a, a rigorous uh, teacher of history. The Turkey was, Father Coskren, um, not for any academic or, or personal reason, but because of his gait, because of the way he walked. Um, Mickey Mouse was uh, the rector of St. Joseph Hall, Father McHenry. Um, 59 was uh, Father McGregor, whom students thought uh, favored uh, 59 as his favorite grade. <laughs> um, the monk was Father, Ma Father Mahoney, uh, who lived downstairs in uh, the basement of Joe's and was uh, victimized one day to come out of his room and got, get hit by a hockey puck from the uh, floor hockey. Um, but the one that you're all thinking of, I'm sure, is Wacky Wally. Now, is there anybody here who doesn't know who, hack who Wacky Wally was? Father Walter Heath was in the philosophy department, and he really was a philosopher, although he, he liked to say, uh, I'm as ordinary as mashed potatoes. But he was a very eccentric uh, fellow, and um, he, he came to, to PC after he had been a submarine commander in World War II. Um, there are uh, uh, many tales that students have invented about his, him getting his ship hung up on a submarine net in Tokyo Harbor and all sorts of crazy things like that. But he told me one time that um, he, he was uh, uh, finishing the uh, training school for submarine commanders and the, sh the ship assignments were being handed out. And the commanding officer um, got the alphabet confused, and the next person in line was named Kramer. But the commanding officer gave Kramer his ship assignment before he gave Walter Heath his ship assignment. And Walter Heath told me uh, that that is why Kramer is at the bottom of the Pacific. <laughs> and, and I'm here talking to you. He, he also told me that when he got home from the war, he uh, lived in Boston, a greater Boston, and he got home and, um, you know, his mother was so happy to have him home. And he told her that he was going to go, go, back, go out to buy some civilian clothes the next day. And she said, what are you going to use for money? He said, well, I've been sending you my, my pay all the while I've been in the Navy. She said, oh, I don't have that. I gave that to the missions. <laughs> uh, he, he drew big numbers of students to the masses that he said on the weekend in the old Aquinas Chapel. I remember being there for a seven o'clock mass, which was jammed because the students knew that the homily was going to be something um, unusual. And I remember him talking about eternity and saying to the students, now think about what it would be like to be all alone with your soul. Mm. And there were guys banging on the pews, laughing, and uh, he got them to come to church. <laughs> I remember that word, for some reason, somehow, word used to spread during the weekend when <laughs> Father Heath would be celebrating Mass. So yeah. was, the, the legend built yeah. upon that. So uh, it was, he was certainly he standing room only in Aquinas Chapel. For all his eccentricity, he, he was a very thoughtful man. and. Uh, he, he was uh, really a living philosopher, not just an academic philosopher. What about some of the faculty members, Richard, your colleagues over time? Tell there, us about some, some of the characters there. 
Oh, there, there's such a collection of characters, and, and this could be another quiz for those of you who are listening in. I think that our, <laughs> I've just seen one pop up on the screen. <laughs> I think that in the last 20 years or so, our faculty has been largely devoid of the colorful people who used to be members of the faculty. Um, I think that in my memory, the modern language department would probably come out on top of the colorful people because they had so many people from so many different places. And uh, among those people, you had, uh, it, you know, uh, uh, Vichy Foreign Service Officer from Southeast Asia, a German lawyer who uh, uh, was uh, an interrogator for American forces after World War II, a man who invented a cough, a kind of cough syrup. Uh, uh, there were um, lots of eccentric academics and, and some very talkative people. There was, there was one Dominican uh, whom I won't name, but uh, when people saw him, it would cause a change in their path on campus. <laughs> if they were walking from, say, Stephen Hall to, to Harkins Hall, they might go by way of alumni hall, <laughs> just so as not to be cornered by this man who would talk in a monologue for a half hour before you could escape. But one of the really colorful characters I'd like to mention was uh, a former television figure. Um, his name was Frank Hanley. Uh, the students called him Pops because he, he liked to tell stories in class about his days in television and his days on the stage. And he was a great raconteur uh, so that he could make a 15 minute story out of a trip to the barber shop watching one of the priests get his hair cut, uh, that sort of thing. Um, Frank was a, was a, a lovable uh, uh, fellow. Um, who, who didn't own an automobile and uh, going someplace with him could be risky because his directions might lead you to a com completely different place. You were very fortunate to be joined today by a good friend of yours, uh, Roy Peter Clark, from yes. the class of 1970, retired senior scholar at the Pointer Institute, and uh, also a 2017 honorary degree, the same year that the college uh, bestowed that same honor upon you. And Roy asks, says this, our class takes credit for student activism that brought about reform of the corporation, reform of the curriculum and co-education. Do we deserve it? And speak more broadly about the influence of student activism. Student activism could be mischievous. It could be very serious. And Roy is right in saying that so many important changes happened right around the year that he graduated, which is 1970, um, that they can take some of the credit for the change in the curriculum. In, in uh, the fall of 1971, a lot of uh, important things happened to the college. Most important was the, uh, the admission of women students. Secondly, the introduction of a new core curriculum and quite apart from student activism, the opening of the Slavin Center as a student center that the college had never had before. And so um, uh, he's, he's right. Um, student activism in a political way showed up most significantly in the uh, student resistance to the Vietnam War. And that was uh, very active, nonviolent on campus, but very active, very vocal, and came to a climax uh, in the spring of 1970 when uh, classes were um, suspended at the end of the semester because of what had happened at Kent State. Incidentally, a few weeks ago, Roy was kind enough to write an essay to the members of the class of 2020, those graduating 50 years after him. I read it. <laughs> and it's spectacular. I'll post a link to it in the chat here, but Roy draws parallels between 1970 and 2020. The classes, the two classes could not have a standard graduation and right. there are other things in there. And uh, he's yeah. an amazing writer and it's just a, a really great piece to read. So uh, yeah. I would encourage people to do that if, uh, if they have uh, the time. The, the graduation in 2020 had to be deferred. There was a virtual degree ceremony online, but um, deferred until um, the end of October. Uh, in 1970, um, the graduation took place in the grotto. 
And the speaker on that occasion uh, was Art Buckwald, who was a satirist for the Washington Post. And he did what the students asked. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if Roy had a hand in this. Um, <laughs> but the students asked uh, Buckwald to talk about the war. And so he said what he uh, planned to do was to say every optimistic thing that somebody had said about the war in Vietnam, going back to 1954. And so he did. And, you know, the, the United States was, was deeply engaged in the war in Vietnam at this point in time, in the spring of 1970. And uh, the uh, students were, many of them, waiting to be, to, to be drafted. And so there was no prospect that the war was going to be ended soon. But he started lining up every optimistic statement about the light at the end of the tunnel, which presidents and generals and uh, Vietnamese uh, leaders had been saying, and American leaders and so forth. And by, by the time he got finished, everybody was laughing and laughing very strongly because, you know, obviously all these statements were not amounting to anything like the light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, the students got what they wanted from him. Uh, question, Richard, several versions of, of this, but I'll use this rather general characterization of it. Can you share some thoughts, reflections on the Catholic character of the college as it is now and as it has been? Okay, yeah, that's, that's an important uh, issue because it's come up a couple of times in the last uh, 30 years. And uh, you can see from the comments of students who responded to the invitation for this, uh, that the Catholic character of the college is pretty high on the agenda of alumni. And uh, the question that became so serious in the 1990s was, whether it was important to retain a uh, critical mass of Catholic faculty if the, Catholic, if the college was not to drift into being, you know, just an island college with uh, a very weak Catholic identity. At that point in time, there was uh, intense discussion which climaxed in a meeting in Moore Hall, the Moore Three Room, which holds, I think, or in those days held about 120 people at maximum, was filled with faculty. And it was a very frank discussion about uh, the future of the college as a Catholic institution. And there was a lot of hard feeling and there were scars that remained for years as, as a result of that uh, big discussion. Um, I see Father, somebody pointing Father Quigley's name uh, online. That's right, Father Quigley was intensely involved in that, as, along with Dr. D'Annunzio, who was, I think, president of the Senate at the time. Um, and um, the question of what was to become of the Catholic identity kind of drifted for years, but if the faculty was no longer going to be quite so solidly Catholic, that meant that the Dominicans were going to have to take a much bigger role, which they did uh, uh, in succeeding years and have done in the first couple of decades of the 21st century. It was uh, decided uh, by Father Shanley uh, about 10 years ago, nine years ago, to have uh, a re-examination of the uh, Catholic, uh, of uh, the college mission statement. And the uh, result of that, uh, um, two years later, after a lot of discussion, was a broadly accepted statement uh, re redefining the mission of Providence College as a Catholic liberal arts college, which would accept people of all uh, um, uh, religious identities or no religious identities and people of uh, all uh, ethnic origins and so forth. So it's a statement which is uh, quite universal in terms of its openness to all people while at the same time uh, reiterating the commitment uh, of the college to uh, learning by both faith and reason. I'm sorry, that was a long-winded response. Oh, beautiful. So did you ever have to eat dinner in Aquinas Hall wearing a shirt and tie? Does this sound familiar to you? I did. Oh, okay. Uh, 
I did. Um, I'm, I wore a tie today for the first time in a, in a couple of months. Uh, in public, uh, sitting, sitting. Yeah, um, you know, food. This is probably going to be a big issue with people who are um, tuned in today. And I know uh, some of them worked in the in the college dining hall. Um, food is a favorite uh, subject for students to complain about. The students have various options uh, in college dining uh, nowadays, which we didn't have uh, when I was a student. We, we had uh, hockey pucks on, uh, Wednesday, on Saturdays, I guess it was, and Roadrunner, which was a scrawny so kind of chicken on Sundays, and uh, something that uh, the students called maggots and worms, which I think would be politely called American chop suey, and uh, other things which were given names that were obscene. Uh, but the, uh, and on Friday we had a kind of fish that the students called sewer trout. Um, and the, the diet nowadays is so much better, but students still love to complain about it. Creative names, if nothing else, the high marks for all of that, right? <laughs> yeah. so that's good. By the way, to go back just to something a couple of minutes ago, Roy uh, Peter Clark mentioned something else in the chat window here. He met Art Buckwald years later after the 1970 commencement speech, and Mr. Buckwald cited that speech as one of the remarkable experiences of his life. So made an impression on him too, which is great. <laughs> how has the question from Katie, how has the CIV program evolved and changed over the years, both the honors program and regular BWC? Okay, sure. Uh, a change in the core curriculum occurred in 2010. And the, the biggest arguing point in years of discussion about uh, changing the core curriculum was uh, Western civilization. And what happened with, with the change um, was that <laughs> the report of the committee for um, revision of Western civilization was uh, rejected ultimately by the faculty senate. I happened to serve on that committee, so it's a touchy issue with me. But the report of the committee was uh, rejected and Western civilization was reduced from a five day, 20 credit course to 16 credits, which meets three times a week or four times a week now, two seminar hours uh, plus two lecture hours at this point in time, it no longer has a five day uh, obligation. The honors program, uh, Western Civilization program, which is the original program, it was a development out of the Great Books program of the 1960s and became the integrated uh, uh, interdisciplinary program in honors uh, in the early 1970s. And that was or actually the late 1960s. And that was adopted uh, uh, in uh, a, a different formulation for the general DWC program. So honors remains the same as it has always been. Uh, when the, the large Western civiliz civilization sections have three semesters of chronological development and a theme-oriented seminar for the fourth, semender, fourth semester. So that's in brief what has happened. Um, Curriculum change tends to be one of the uh, um, touchiest issues regularly on college campuses. But one of the things that uh, was important about the curriculum that was adopted in 2010 was that it retained the principle of uh, uh, 1971 that uh, the college should have a core curriculum rather than a very open curriculum with few requirements. Let's look forward a little bit, if you don't mind uh, taking a few more minutes, Richard. We've just drifted past one o'clock. You know Father Sicard, who will succeed Father Shanley very well. You've made uh, no secret of your admiration for Father Shanley, and I would, I would guess that you have uh, high hopes for the college's future under Father Sicard's leadership, too. Yes, yeah. Um, they're on the same page. Um, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, if, if I can talk as simply and as a, a, an observer commenting from the visitors gallery in a sense, because I'm now an emeritus professor and not a member of the ordinary faculty, uh, what I've seen is that a, is a really good working relationship between them. And one of the um, 
issues that has been urgent for both of them in the last 10 years has been diversity and uh, developing uh, uh, a more diverse student population and a more diverse uh, faculty. And uh, the um, growth, you know, I, I don't want to bore you with a lot of statistics, uh, but, but the growth has, has been that in the last, well, between 2010 and 2015, uh, when I was gathering information for the college history, the number of Hispanic students and the number of African American students had doubled in each of those categories. So, so now I think it's something like 450 uh, students uh, uh, combining the Hispanic and African American communities on campus. And I know that Father Sicard is very much attached to, to this issues, and so I can anticipate uh, a lot more attention to this as the as the years go by. In a more general sense, what what are your hopes and dreams for the future of the college you love so much? What do you, what do you see in, in front of after, of course, getting through this this uh, very difficult period we're in right now? Um, when I gave my concluding remarks, uh, when Jane Perel and I were asked to give concluding remarks as we were about to retire um, six years ago. I, I said that I hoped that I would live long enough to see the centennial, which I have, and I hope that the college would remain a Catholic college, and I hope that it would remain a, a liberal arts college. And uh, in the conclusion of that ceremony, Father Shanley said that he shared my hopes, and so I think I'm in good company. <laughs> Absolutely. So one more subject that I know is important to you, and I thought we would wrap up with it, Richard, and that's uh, study abroad. It's something oh, yeah. that uh, you consider to be very important to the college experience, something you've participated in uh, a lot over the, the uh, course of, of your, your time here. We'll, um, we'll take a look at a picture of a group of students getting ready in 1974 to okay. leave for, for Europe with uh, Father Peterson posing with them. So. Um, what, what has this meant to the, to the college and to the educational experience for people who have, who have taken this route when they were students? I, I recognize this group and I was there for that departure. <laughs> um, I recognize a lot of people in this group. You know, the, the um, study, study abroad was not a um, very uh, a broad phenomenon in the 1960s when I was at Providence College, there was one student, uh, John Williams, uh, who went to Fribourg uh, when I was an undergraduate. He was the only one in my four years at the college who went overseas to study. Uh, but subsequently, uh, that grew, it grew particularly in the 1970s. And so that, that was a big class uh, departing in uh, that was a class of 75. So they were leaving, I think, in the, in, uh, the fall of 73, perhaps. Um, and um, Fribourg was, was the destination. Fribourg was a good place to be in Europe. We had a resident director there. Larry Guzzi was the resident director for a while. Paul Gallagher was the resident director for a good number of years. And um, uh, it was a good place to be because it's right in the center of Europe and you could be in Berlin or Vienna or in Paris in, in a few hours. Uh, it was a, a, a lovely old, um, in many ways, still medieval city. Um, uh, but subsequently, the college um, suspended uh, having its own resident director there and went to a much broader kind of opportunity so that students might study in South Africa or Japan. We retained programs for, for a while with the University of Glasgow, uh, where my son Ben uh, went, went to school, and uh, uh, with Blackfriars uh, College at uh, Oxford University. And we also had a, a summer program, summer study program in Pietra Santa, Italy, which was the town where Michelangelo lived when he quarried his marble at Monte Altissimo. And that was my experience for three summers in the 70s uh, with the study abroad program being in Pietra Santa, which is uh, um, 
you know, only five kilometers off the Mediterranean and, and uh, has some remnants of the old uh, city wall dating back to Michelangelo's time. Uh, one, one last thing though about uh, um, study abroad. There were a couple of problems uh, in, in the study abroad program uh, that persisted for quite a long time until the college finally faced up to them and, and made some uh, changes. Um, which Father Shanley supported, I think because he had the experience of going to Freeburg himself as an undergraduate. Um, one, one was the um, partial year residence. If a student were going overseas for one semester of his or her junior year, there was no assurance that they were going to get uh, on-campus housing. Uh, for the other semester. And so that was a deterrent. And the other thing was that uh, students had to pay the whole freight once they went overseas, even if they had academic scholarships or financial aid uh, in another respect from Providence College. And so the college made all scholarships portable. And these two things, making the scholarships portable and uh, making arrangements for students to live on campus for one semester, if they're going overseas for the other semester, those made it possible for a lot more students to go overseas. Nowadays, we do have a program in Rome uh, which uh, is, uh, was established by the theology department and there is a resident uh, director there for that program and the college is just about to start a program in London uh, uh, which would be uh, connected to the Western Civ requirement in the core curriculum. So that's in the offing I think to begin next year. So, yes, indeed. That sounds like a wonderful program and students are very interested in it. So very yeah, exciting. I would be. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet. I bet. Well, we can't thank you enough for your time today, Richard. This has been wonderful. We're so for fortunate to have you in our community and to have you there to help us understand the college's origins and its impact and really to provide the, the insights that we need to fully appreciate what the institution is, is all about. So thank you so much. We hope you, know, you and Mrs. Grace have a wonderful summer. If I can just say one more thing, Joe, it is that there are so many other names of uh, people who are colleagues that students will remember that I wish I could have recited. People like uh, um, Fabe Cunningham and, and uh, Paul Philibert and Gus Cody and, and uh, Dr. Edwin Gora, and Rodney De La Santa and Paul Thompson and Rainey Fort. And we, we've had such a uh, a wonderful faculty experience and I have to mention Pat McKay at the end because he had such an influence as academic vice president. So here's a toast to them all. Can, can you identify this person for us? <laughs> That's Rodney De La Santa who succeeded me as director of the honors program and he did a wonderful job at that. Appears to be in the library and uh... It, that's in the library. Right. That's right. Yeah. Very good. Uh, you're, you're a good friend, I know, and we'll had that picture waiting for you to say his name. So, <laughs> so that is, that is very good. So oh, once thanks. again, thank you so much, Richard. We appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for joining us. It's been a nice afternoon and uh, we appreciate your interest and go Friars. <laughs> go Friars.